Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this afternoon of study on the milestones and stumbling stones in the current dialogue between Jews, Christians and Muslims. My name is Stein Latre. I am the director of UXIA, the University Centre St. Ignatius Antwerp, and I'm very happy that we can actually carry out this dialogue despite the difficult COVID circumstances that prevent us from uh, yeah, uh, having a more incarnated dialogue. So I'm very happy to be here with you, with Emmanuel van Lierde of Tertio. Uh, we are here on the occasion of uh, to celebrate also the 20, 20th anniversary of Tertio. And we are also co-organizing this event with the Institute for Jewish Studies. So before I uh, give the floor to Vivian Liska of the Institute for Jewish Studies for a, a welcome address and to Emmanuel van Lierde to moderate this chat, I run to, or to mo moderate this afternoon and the Q&A chat afterwards. Uh, I run through some uh, technical issues. Uh, so if you experience any technical problems, uh, then you can uh, contact the uh, moderator, Gilde Gunst, or Marijke Selis, who is also present here in the chat room. Um, please use Go Google Chrome as your browser in its uh, latest uh, update. Uh, you can stop pop-up notifications by clicking on the settings wheel. You have a menu on the right-hand corner of your screen. You can unfold that menu and then select the, the wheel, the settings wheel, and adjust the notification settings. For your privacy, I have to say that this session will be recorded and posted also on the websites of Tertio and Uxia, where you will also find the texts in English and in Dutch uh, available afterwards. So you can choose your the media of your preference. And after um, so the uh, presentations of the keynote speakers, whom I welcome very warm, warm heartedly. So welcome to all keynote speakers. They will be presented to you by Emmanuel van Lierde. After the presentations and the responses, we will have Q&A, the possibility for you as audience to interact with the speakers, not uh, by using your voice, but by using the chat, the chat function for everyone. You can find it also in the uh, menu I just explained to you. Uh, you can click on the text balloon and then post your messages there. Please uh, keep it, uh, keep these messages uh, 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 yes, uh, restricted to uh, the content of the webinar, not for personal messages to one another. So you can post your questions there. They will be taken up by uh, the moderator of uh, this uh, session, Emmanuel van Lierde. But now I grant the floor to Vivian Liska. Vivian, can you speak to us, please? Thank you. Um, dear Monsignor Bonny, dear Stan and Hilke, dear Emmanuel, dear speakers, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Institute of Jewish Studies at the University of Antwerp. I'm glad to see so many of you joining here today for this promising online colloquium on the current dialogue between Jews, Christians, and Muslims. I hope you and your loved ones are all in good health in these scary times. This colloquium is organized in celebration of Tertio's 20th anniversary, and I wish to congratulate Manuel van Lierde, chief editor of Tertio, and one of the main organizers of this event, and all his co-workers for the special anniversary. Need to be applauded for many years. So, warm congratulations. I would also like to thank and that project coordinator Hilke for the as always pleasant and inspiring cooperation and for approaching us to part in this colloquium by providing a Jewish perspective to the dialogue of today. And we are very grateful to Rabbi David Meyer of the Gregorian University for being back in our context uh, and for so generously offering his insights into this matter. Uh, there was a wonderful event many years ago uh, where uh, Rabbi Meyer uh, spoke uh, and uh, it was really one of the unforgettable moments 
uh, of an activity of the Institute of Jewish Studies together uh, with Uxia. Uh, he unfortunately could not participate here live today. He was kind to send in a video message as a response uh, to Professor Vete's uh, lecture. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, we can, in this way, uh, meet again after a meeting in Jerusalem. Finally, my special thanks and appreciation to all the speakers and respondents who have provided their input and cooperation. We are honored to see so many prominent scholars gathered here to share with the and with the wider audience the expertise in the current dialogue between Jews, Christians, and Muslims. I wish you all an inspiring online colloquium. Thank you so much, uh, Vivian. Uh, there was some problem with the connection, but we heard uh, from you that you were very grateful for organizing this event together with us. Uh, thank you for recalling also some events we had in the past together, uh, Uxia yeah. and the Institute for Jewish Studies. And now I uh, grant the floor to Emmanuel Van Dier, the editor in chief of RTO. Thank you, Stan. Uh, and also, in my behalf, welcome to everybody in the name of uh, the Christian Weekly Tertio. I wish to thank, first of all, my uh, colleagues, uh, Vivian Liska of the Institute of Jewish Studies and Stan Latre and colleagues of Uxia. I'm very glad that we can collaborate together once more. It's not the first time with both of these institutes that we can collaborate. Uh, the initiative started because of our 20th celebration of Tercio, 20 years of existence. And one of our priorities uh, from the start is also ecumenism, interreligious dialogue, and also dialogue with other uh, worldviews. So, in this uh, priority, we organized this debate as one of the events during our Jubilee year. Uh, unfortunately, I have to apologize Imam Khalid Ben Hadou, who is sick. Uh, he was already sick the last weeks, but it was up and down. And unfortunately, he is not there today with us. So this response will not be there. But it gives us more time for the other lectures. I don't want to take much of time. I want to have uh, the time for the speakers. So first part is the dialogue between Christians, Catholics, and uh, the Jewish people and community. I'm glad to uh, introduce to you uh, Father Etienne uh, Vete, who is professor at Gregoriana University in Rome and also chairholder of the, and director of the Cardinal Bea Institute for Jewish Studies at Gregoriana. After his lecture, there will be a response of Rabbi David Meyer, but that will be on video. It will follow after Etienne's lecture, and I'm glad to give him the floor. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Thank you for, to all the organizers for, for having me here with you. I hope everything, everybody hears me well. It seems so. Perfect. Uh, so, um, uh, I will start this lecture by simply uh, saying that history deals with surprises and paradoxes. Um, sometimes they're bad and sometimes they're good. And recent history of Jewish-Christian relations has been one of these surprises and has been an astonishingly good one. Someone, if, we, if ever we were able to bring someone from the middle of the 20th century teleport this person into time right now, this person would have a very difficult time in, um, believing what he or she sees. Um, the present state of affair is way above what someone could have expected 60 or 70 years ago. So I will start by presenting the major breakthroughs in these past 60, 70 years in Jewish-Christian dialogue. Uh, mainly through documents. Um, I must uh, say that because of the time limits, I will limit myself to Catholic documents. It would be interesting to go also and see how other Christian denominations have 
um, been in discussion and dialogue with uh, Jews in Judaism, but it won't be possible now. Um, and so the first part will be the milestones, will be the achievements, the breakthroughs. But after uh, 20 centuries of difficulties, it's not in a few decades that we can solve all the problems. So in the second time, I will present some of the difficulties and stumbling blocks and try to propose some suggestions uh, for the future. So first of all, uh, the milestones in the current dialogue, the latest documents. I will first of all start with the documents of the Catholic Church, and then I will pass on to documents that were written by rabbis or Jewish scholars. Of course, the documents of the, the Catholic Church, the big breakthrough, the watershed event, is not recent. It was in 1965. It was the fourth chapter of this document from the Vatican, from Vatican II Council called Nostra Eta, the document on the relation between the Catholic Church and other religions. And the fourth section, the fourth chapter, was about relation to uh, the Jewish people. Since it's a rather, it's not a recent document, I will go quickly on this one, but I still think that there are three or four main points that I should stress, because they are the foundation that will come afterwards. First of all, something that touches more of the perception of the Catholic Church, its own self-perception, but it's the fact that the Church recalls that she is rooted in the Jewish people and in the religious tradition. The Church receives the revelation made by God to the people of Israel. Uh, this is the basis of the Church's faith. And the First Testament, the Tanakh or the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, covers 75% of Christian scriptures. So this is fundamental. Christians consider themselves the spiritual stock of Abraham. This seems obvious to us now, but it's essential that it be explicit and that it be underlined as essential dogmatic dimension of the identity of the church. The other uh, aspects of Nostra Aetate that I will underline concern less the perception that the Catholic Church has of herself and more the way she perceives the Jewish people. Uh, and it's very central because these have been probably the points that have helped uh, the Jewish partner to uh, enter into dialogue or to continue in the dialogue. Three things, maybe, yes, I'll just quickly say three things. Number one, Jews are not to be considered collectively responsible for the death of Jesus. This, in a certain way, contradicts a long history of Christian teaching. It was never a magisterial teaching. It was never taught with the full authority, binding authority, that Catholics give to the magisterium. But it was very, very present in the, the long history of the teaching of the church fathers and of theologians, that Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus. What the council says, what Nostra Aetate says is, of course, some Jews of the time of Jesus were accountable for Jesus' death, but so were the Romans. And of course, the Romans are the one who actually killed him. And this is a very central point. And Judas, one of the disciples of Jesus, one of the chosen apostles, was a main actor in this event. So, so very, uh, just, uh, they were not only the Jews, and of the Jews, a very small portion, uh, and some of the head of the heads of the Jews, and not even all. So this is, what, and so the Jewish people cannot bear collectively, and in the future generations, this responsibility. Another point, which uh, comes from this one, is that Jews are not to be considered an accursed people, uh, as the Council says. God holds. Jewish people most dear. The love of God for the Jewish people is full and is still there and is fully there. And finally, the council officially and firmly decries anti-Semitism. I will get back to this point in the end of, our, uh, of this conference.
After Nostradate, there were quite a few significant documents. Now, since this online lecture is a bit shorter than the in-presence lecture would be, and I think everybody, I hope this is true, uh, uh, it will be confirmed by the uh, organizers. Everybody has the text of mm, the lectures, so I don't have to quote all the documents. I will, I, I will just trust that you will, you can read on page two <laughs> that there's a series of documents. I will just say two things about these documents. Many documents come from a commission in the Vatican, which is called the Commission for Religious Relations with the Jews a typical council for promoting Christian unity. This is the commission that is officially entrusted relation with the Jews. Um, there have been quite a few documents since Vatican II, and the last one from 2015 is a, is a, a major one, um, and I will quote it quite, quite a few times. It's called, The Gifts and the Calling of God are Irrevocable, which is a quotation from Romans 11.29, but I will generally call it the 2000 document, 2015 document, uh, to shorten. And the other thing is that uh, of many important steps have been actually taken by popes, not only by Vatican documents, and in particular by John Paul II. Uh, and these are important steps because they have much more authority than Vatican documents. Some of these uh, steps that have been taken by John Paul II are, can be really considered as binding for Catholic faithful. What, what do these Catholic documents say? I'm going to synthesize this in three assertions that we can find if we gather all these documents together. The first aspect is that the Catholic Church states that its relation to the Jewish people is unique. It does not have the same relation to any other religion or religious tradition. Uh, as I said before, it, the, the church recalls that its, the, its roots are in the patriarchs and its roots are in the of Israel. But what often people don't realize is that roots are a present uh, reality. Often when we think of roots, we think of something that is the past. Yes, our roots are, and we'll think about past events or past centuries, but in a tree, the roots are what gives the tree now its strength and its strength. And very inter interestingly, in Nostra Aetate, when the Catholic Church says that Christianity, the Church, is rooted in the patriarchs, it, it re and she re the church uh, re receives her nourishment from, from these roots, it's a present tense. It's not past tense, it's right now. So this is really a question that we can even start asking. How does the church, how can the church receive in the present tense its nourishment from the Jewish people and from a living relation to the Jewish people. And this is why a 2015 document will actually say that we cannot consider Jewish Christian dialogue as a, a dialogue as interreligious dialogue in the strict sense of the word, not interreligious, but intra religious, even intra family dialogue. There is something for which you could say, I'm going to my own conclusion to this point, the Catholic Church and the whole of the Church of Christ cannot be herself without a living relation to the Jewish people. It is a necessity. We cannot be ourselves without the Jewish people. A second aspect, which is fundamental, is that the Church does not consider the new covenant to annul, to cancel, and replace the covenant with the Jewish people. Uh, many fathers of the church and theologians have said the contrary. So this is a, a, a fundamental statement. But here comes, here we can bring in John Paul II, 1980 declaration in Mainz, in Germany. He said, the old covenant was never revoked by God. And this was taken up by the, Cath the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It was taken up by Pope Francis. Again. So it is really part of Catholic uh, magisterium right now. What does this mean? 
the Jewish people, according to Christian faith, have never lost their place in the history of salvation. They are still an active participant in the history of salvation, and the, they are playing an, a role in the history of the world, and this will be the case until the end of time. The third uh, statement that I would like to underline, that the teaching that comes from these Catholic documents, is concerns mission towards the Jewish people. This was a very fundamental thing to um, help the Jewish people, the Jewish partners, to enter into more trust with the Catholic Church. We know the history of forced conversions, of forced baptisms. And we also know that the Church considers that her mission is to proclaim the gospel. Okay, what do we do in this case when we are in front of the Jewish people? Very clearly, the 2015 document says the church does not have, should not have, an institutional mission towards the Jewish people. This does not mean that the individual Christian should not give witness to his or her faith. It is the treasure of our life. Uh, if we enter into deep friendship with a Jew, um, we are allowed to, we may even need to be able to give witness to what makes our, what is our treasure. But the church should refrain from an institutional mission. I can't enter into too much detail right now, maybe this could be a question, but why does the church say this? This is in a certain way an exception in her mission. Well, first of all, because we first need to remember again that we receive our knowledge of God from the Jewish people. Before starting to think we can teach something, we need to recognize once again and very strongly that we are the ones who start by receiving. And also the document, the 2015 document says that after the Shoah, or it makes us understand that after the Shoah, the church may not have, has not the same moral authority. To put it in another way, after years of of centuries of persecution, the church, the church's authority in, in in front of the Jewish people has really been weakened, and she may not have the authority to speak in this sense. And of course, this is a paradoxical statement. It's not very well explained in the 2015 document, but um, even though the church considers that there is that all salvation comes through Jesus, and there there are no two ways of salvation, for example, or multiple ways of salvation. Still, we cannot say that the Jewish people is outside of salvation. Jews are not outside of salvation. Even if they do not, and this is very clearly in the document, if they do not confess Jesus Christ explicitly. And this, it's true that we think of Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, the matriarchs, Dave, Moses, David, the prophets, and also all the holy men and women of Judaism in the past 2,000 years, how can we say that these people are not part of salvation? So this, this is for the Christian documents. Now to the Jewish documents. Um, I look, you can look on page three, at the bottom of page three, I will mainly quote three documents that are written by rabbis and scholars. Dabu Emet from the year 2000, uh, to do the will of our Father in heaven, uh, Orthodox rabbinic statement on Christianity, to do the will of our Father in heaven from 2015, and between Jerusalem and Rome from 2017. These documents do not have the same authority as the Catholic documents because the Catholic documents are teaching of the church either full magisterium or authoritative documents. Here we have uh, individuals or um, groups of rabbis who have written these documents. But what's interesting, so they're speaking only in their name, but what's interesting is that each time for each one of, well, as we go forward in time, each of these documents has been signed and received by more and more uh, rabbis and scholars, and a wider aspect of uh, the different traditions of Judaism. So here also, 
uh, I'm going just to underline three teachings that we can take from these different documents. The first one, and I think Christians need to hear, to listen to how important this is. These documents say that Jews can now start trusting Christians. Jews can now start trusting, putting some trust in the church. I say that we Christians need to hear this because we often do not perceive that there is this problem. After 60 or 70 years of dialogue and hundreds of years of interrelation, uh, but it's true that after persecution and Shoah and uh, these past centuries, it is a major step. Dabrunet says Christianity has changed dramatically. And the 2017 document says it has become clear that the transformations in the church's attitudes and teachings are not only sincere, but increasingly profound. These statements are courageous, and I hope, I pray that the church may, be, may show herself worthy of this trust. A second major point, which is a bit similar to what the Catholic documents, but you'll see it's also a bit different, is that these documents underline that Christianity is in a unique relation to Judaism. There is a unique relation between Judaism and Christianity. Of course, uh, these documents also stress that there are deep theological differences, deep differences of faith, but at the same time, and, and they do not say what uh, the 2015 Vatican document says, which is that we may not be speaking about another religion, that we may be speaking about something which is inside the same religious tradition. This, this none of the Jewish documents says, but it, they do say that Christians are just, are not any other kind of religion. Christians believe in the God who is creator and who has liberated the people of Israel from Egypt. This is important because it means uh, the, the, the Jewish documents are recognizing that Christians do not only have the same idea of God or partly the same idea of God, but they have a relation to the same personal God who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who is the God of Israel. Christians relate to the God of Israel. And uh, Dabru Emet uh, concludes, or uh, actually it's in the introduction, that through Christianity, hundreds of millions of people have entered into relationship with the God of Israel. So this is a quite an impressive statement. And the third, the third aspect is that the third point that, that is present in all these documents, and actually this is a point that we can find in practically every kind of a document concerning Jewish Christian dialogue, is that Jews and Christians have a common responsibility for the world. Responsibility for justice, for peace, for ethical progress in the world, to fight against barb barbarisms, to fight against anti-Semitisms, to promote religious freedom. In Hebrew, we would say tikkun uh, olam, which is to repair the world in, in together. And the 2015 document, to do the will of our Father in heaven, even goes uh, further. And Rabbi Mayer will quote this in the video. So I'm reminding you of this before, well, reminding you. I'm introduced <laughs> before he says it, um, that we actually, Christians and, do, and Jews, have a, cov a common, I quote, covenantal mission, a common covenantal mission, which I understand as the document saying that Christians also have received a covenant by God and that their work is a covenantal work. And uh, this document says Christianity is not an error of, of history. It's not an accident of history. It is part of God's design. This, is a very, it, this was not received by everybody, but it is a very powerful, a very powerful step. 
These were the milestones. These were these impressive breakthroughs. I hope they've been clear, even though they've been in a very concentrated form. Now, what is the next, what, where are we going to? Where are the stumbling blocks? Or to put it in a more positive way, um, what should, where, where's our future? What are the next steps? You've probably noticed that so far I have quoted only documents. This is probably the first difficulty. We have gone forward. We've had fabulous breakthroughs and milestones as far as official and scholarly documents are concerned. The question now is, how will it reach all Jews and all Christians? How will this trickle down? This is a bit of a unique situation. At least I'm going to speak as a Catholic theologian. Uh, it's a unique situation to say, uh, or uh, not a unique, but it's a rare situation to say, uh, the church teaching authority is way ahead, has made many steps, for, is many steps further than most of the parishes, most of the local churches, mo many theologians too. I would say. So how, how will we receive this teaching, have it trickle down and touch everyone? And then I'll try to give two, um, let's say, paths of an answer to this. And then I will try also to, uh, to um, show some theological questions that could be future questions. But this first step is not a theological step. It's it's not it's not about religious thought. It's about how does this enter into the consciousness of all Jews and of all Christians. And when we want something to enter into the consciousness of everyone, I think the two main uh, group of people that can help us are on one hand the formators, and on the other hand, children and youth. Children and youth. What do I mean by this? I mean that. These are the two groups that we could, we should probably work with the most to get this teaching to trickle down. Um, formation, what do I mean by this? What I mean is, right now we are in a situation in which in many theological faculties, in many seminaries, and probably also in many formations for lay people and catechisms, there is a section devoted to Jewish Christian dialogue. But we need more than a section. We need all the past uh, uh, breakthroughs to be able to touch the whole of our theology and the whole of our conception of faith. This is what happened in Christianity through the ecumenical movement. What happened? We started by working on ecumenism, and at some point, it transformed the whole of our perception of our faith and of the church. Very concretely, for example, once we start saying that some Christians that are not in my church, in our church, are truly members of the body of Christ, it necessarily changes the way we understand the church. I would say the same thing for our relation to the Jewish people. I'm going to just give an example from the perspective of Christianity. Once we say that the Jewish people have not lost the promises of God, the calling of God, this means that they are still the chosen people of God. But the church also says that she is the people of God. How do we put together these two, uh, these two sentences, these two assertions? It needs to change our perception of the church. And this is true for practically every aspect of our faith and of our teaching. And as far as children are concerned, we know that children are, uh, well, m fabulous friendships, fabulous relations are created, established, when we are children and young people. And friendship is central in any kind of dialogue, and it's central in Jewish Christian relations. If we start with children, if we start with young people, we can build up true relations, and we build up, we build people who have 
a, a, wor a full world view that integrates this kind of dialogue, who, that understands this kind of dialogue. Of course, one has to be extremely careful because uh, children are very uh, easily indoctrinated. Young people are very easily indoctrinated. But at the same time, I think it's not indoctrination to, in books for children, in movies for children, in games for children, to be to have the dialogue and the new perception that Jews and Christians have of each other enter and become part of the um, culture of this time. I'm only speaking about Jewish Christian dialogue because this is my theme, of course. I could widen it much more. What are the theological questions that we could still be working on, that we should still be working on? Uh, I'm, uh, you realize that I'm skipping through my, my text. So <laughs> um, I'm now on page, at the bottom of page seven. Well, I'm entering into point two, point two, some possible next theological steps. I will start by steps that uh, the Christians should take, and then I will try to dare uh, suggest some steps to our Jewish partners. Two steps for the Christians. One, huh, this is not new. Unfortunately, it's not new. And unfortunately, it still needs to be tackled, is anti-Semitism. Of course, when I'm thinking of these steps, I'm not only thinking of what a Christian would ask a Christian or what a Christian would ask the church. I'm thinking of what a Jew would ask Christianity. And I think this is one question. What is the situation now with anti-Semitism? It is still not gone. It is still present. And part of it is still based on, uh, in a certain way, a false Christian teaching of an accursed Jewish people who killed Jesus. I would say, I would give two paths to work on, on this question of anti-Semitism. One is, uh, as I was saying about the formators, anti-Semitism should not be reduced. Thinking and reflecting about anti-Semitism should not be reduced to only Jewish Christian dialogue. It should not be only done in the situation of Jewish Christian dialogue. It should be for every kind of training. It should be part of any kind of training. And something else, when we're, we say we want to fight anti-Semitism, we are putting this in negative, combative terms. And they are true. We need to fight anti-Semitism. But to eradicate an evil, one does not only need to fight evil. One also needs to do good. One does not only need to uh, reject evil, but one needs to say good things. And I think this is something that is sometimes missing. We should We should positively say good things about the Jewish people. We should, which uh, this, what this basically means is, I'm going to put it in religious terms. Bless, we should bless the Jewish people. This is in the calling of Abraham. <laughs> you, the nations will be blessed. Those who bless you will be blessed. We should not only combat anti-Semitism, but we should also remind the world of all the goods that have come from the Jewish people in in the uh, in religious realm, in intellectual realm, in scientific realm, and bless the Jewish people for these gifts. I will just conclude by I I, I was going to say something about going further in the reflection about the um, the state of Israel, the land of Israel, the ingathering of the Jewish people on the land of Israel. This is a very sensitive theme. Uh, and so if there are questions on this, I'll be ready to answer. But I do think that our Jewish partners are expecting us to go further on this theme. And what would I suggest to the Jewish partners? As humbly as I can, I, I would dare say two things. The first is, uh, what do you consider is your responsibility regarding the Gentiles? Do you consider that you have a responsibility regarding the Gentiles? Because in, in Isaiah, we have that the Jewish people 
are the light of the nations. In, Ab in Genesis, uh, the Jewish people through Abraham are chosen to be a blessing to all the nations. Is this part of the life and of the preoccupations of the Jewish people today and how? How to become a blessing to the nations, how to be a light to the nations. And the last point um, is, this is a, a sensitive one, is it possible that Jesus be considered as a rabbi, that his teaching be considered as one part of the Jewish tradition? I am not saying, is Jesus a messiah? This is really not my question, but many, we are discovering through many Jewish scholars how Jewish Jesus was. And he was actually one of the first persons, maybe the first person historically, to have been called rabbi. In synagogues, this is Amy Jill Levine, um, a, a Jewish scholar of the New Testament uh, at Vanderbilt University who says this, I'm just going to quote her. She says, in reform and conservative synagogues, we hear about non-observant Jews like Einstein. We hear about atheist Jews like Freud. We hear about non-Jews like Plato or Buddha. Why don't we ever hear about this observant, practicing, religious Jew who was Jesus? Okay, this is, <laughs> I know it's very sensitive because the word Jesus, the name Jesus, evokes a past bitter history. But maybe this is one of the steps that we could look towards in the next uh, decades. I'm finished here. Um, I don't know what the future will be. I hope that it will be uh, as different, uh, uh, that we can be as optimistic about the future as um, um, the breakthroughs of the last uh, decades have shown us that we could be and should be. Thank you very much, Father Professor Etienne Vite, for this uh, short lecture and giving very headlines of what you were going to tell, but people can read your lecture again in extensive form. Uh, we can keep some things in mind that were crucial, I think. Uh, I've seen already some questions in the chat box. We keep them for the Q&A at the end. But now we go to a video response of uh, Rabbi David Meyer, who is teaching now in New York but who is also uh, connected to the Gregoriana University in Rome and uh, in your center of Jewish studies. Send us a video with his response and I think we can see it shortly now. Well, let me first of all thank uh, Professor Vivian Liska and the Institute of Jewish Studies, as well as Terfio and the UCSIA for not only making this event possible despite the pandemic challenges, but for inviting me, at least remotely, to participate in today's lecture and to respond to uh, Father Zveto. Thank you very much, Father Zveto, for the inspiring presentation you just gave. You have highlighted for us the very important aspect of the recent breakthrough that are comforting us who are involved in dialogue between Judaism and Christianity. And you have also pointed to challenges which are confronting us as well, as we continue to look ahead, practical challenges and theological challenges as well. You have given us a great deal to think about and you have opened many horizons. Some of them are of course more encouraging than others. And I am in particular very sensitive to the dichotomy you have presented, whereby the greatest achievement of dialogue are to be found in the textual legacy, as the trickling down, as you called it, of the letter and the spirit of those documents remains, of course, an unceasing challenge. Is dialogue, therefore, like revelation itself, that is producing a great written book and yet with a more difficult and hesitant infusing of the hearts. Now in the short time allocated for my response, attempting to formulate a rabbinic perspective on these questions, I will not have time to develop a point by point argument which would reflect on every idea evoked by Father Veto. 
I would rather try to find a way to encapsulate, maybe under one single heading and one single topic, what I, as a rabbi and as a professor of rabbinic literature and contemporary Jewish thought, teaching at the heart of the Catholic world at the Gregorian University in Rome, and listening to the words of Father Vito, what I perceive as an overreaching breakthrough that is simultaneously an overarching challenge in dialogue. In other words, the perspective that I would like to take is to suggest that from a rabbinic point of view, there is possibly one overarching breakthrough among the many topics touched upon by Father Veteux that should really be considered as what I would call a challenging breakthrough in dialogue for Judaism. That is not a breakthrough alone and not a challenge alone, but really a challenging breakthrough therefore deconstructing the suggested dichotomy, which is assumed in the title of this conference. Now, Father Vedo has pointed out towards the end of his presentation one important theological challenge, a challenge or a question he addressed directly to us Jews. He argued, and rightly so, that the church needs a living relation with the Jewish people in order to be truly herself. And while this is not, in theory, reciprocal, the following issue must be addressed by Judaism. Do we have a responsibility in respect to the Gentile? Now, this question asked by Father Veto is audacious, deep, and I will try to answer it not so much as an intellectual question demanding an articulated and theologically structured answer, because this is not the way rabbinic Judaism functions, but by giving it a more emotional and a more practical twist touching on the nerve center of the relationship between our two traditions. The real nerve of dialogue can be reduced to one simple single word, friendship. The friendship between our two traditions. Nothing could have been achieved, nothing, without that friendship. It is therefore through the angle of an inquiry about the meaning of friendship that I would like to try and answer Father Zvetu's questions about our responsibility towards the Gentiles. Father Vedo gave us an excellent panoramic overview of the history of the friendship between Judaism and Christianity in the last 70 years. Maybe suffice to add that the personal friendship of the pioneers in dialogue turned into a friendship between two religious traditions where faith meet faith and not heresy or false belief. Not just Jews and Christians speaking and working together, but Judaism and Christianity as separate religious entities, recognizing their shared theological roots and valuing their many respective diverging paths. And then a few years ago, coming from the Jewish side of the partnership, a new milestone in friendship was reached echoing the calls of the church. In 2015, the Orthodox Israeli rabbinate, reviving for the occasion some teaching from the vast and past rabbinic literature, went as far as to declare, and I quote, that the emergence of Christianity in human history is neither an accident nor an error but the will, divine outcome, and gift to the nations. This is really how far we have reached in friendship, and this is really how much was achieved. But if friendship is to be more than words on the document, and if words are to really carry true meaning as both our interpretative and exegetical traditions believe, then one is bound to question the practical meaning of such words. If Christianity is not an accident, if it is the expression of a divine will, what does that truly mean from a Jewish and rabbinic perspective? What does it mean to affirm that the existence and the presence of your friend is not an accident? It is asking this question, in asking this question, that the breakthrough becomes a real challenge. 
Now, to try to formulate the true nature and scope of the challenge, I would like very briefly to turn to a short Talmudic text, in fact, a Mishnah with a short Gemara, which appears in Tractate Shabbat 41a. Now, let us sort of open briefly the Talmudic parenthesis. It's an alachic legal parenthesis that will appear at first to be seemingly completely unrelated to our topic. The Mishnah, which is the first legal code of the second century, discusses the legal problem of warming up water on Shabbat without infringing on the prohibition of using fire as a source of heat for that day. And with some ingenuity, the Mishnah then declares, and I quote here, the miliarium that has been cleaned from its hot hashes or coals, we can drink from its hot water on Shabbat. But the antichi, even if all the hot coals have been removed, one cannot use its hot water on Shabbat. That's simple, straight Mishnah. Now we can all agree that this alachic ruling is indeed unrelated to the question of the challenges of Jewish Christian friendship in our century. It's unrelated unless, unless we set our eyes and our minds on the two technical words of miliarium and antichi that are used to describe the kind of warming process of the water. Both are kind of boilers, if you want, from antiquity. One is from the Latin, the miliarium, and the other one is from the Greek, antichi. The first one refers to a Roman heating device, the second one to its Greek equivalent, but not entirely identical in its construction. Now, the reference to the Greek and Latin word that is from the Greco-Roman tradition, which is a symbol for Christianity in so many rabbinic texts, this reference to describe the possibility of a Shabbat warming process to enjoy hot water is potentially highly revealing and significant. Well, for the sake of intellectual honesty, I must clarify that the Mishnaic text is indeed alachic and not metaphorical. Nevertheless, I think the images it uses to express its own legal concern can reach really beyond the intended legal scope. So let us reformulate the question of the Mishnah. This is what I would say. Can one rely on a Christian, that is, read Greco-Roman, know-how to warm up our own Shabbat? This is the question that the Talmud confronts us with and asks us to ponder. This is the question, the momental question, framed in halachic terms, but read through the lens of a Jewish-Christian focus that stand ahead of us. As Jews, do we want to be theologically warmed by Christianity? I'm not here merely asking if Judaism is interested in Christianity at an intellectual, historical, theological level. I'm not asking either what does Judaism has to gain from a friendly proximity with Christianity. The answer to this question has been, been given many times before. I'm rather asking an emotional question. Do we as Jews somehow want to feel the warmth of Christianity in our lives? It is not do we need to feel the warmth, but do we want to feel the warmth? So I'm talking about the guts, the guts of Judaism. The question, let alone the answer, is in itself an immense challenge for Judaism. I have doubts that any of the signatory of the Declaration of 2015, and for that matter, the majority of the Jews, whatever their affiliation, would easily answer with a, with a resounding and unequivocal yes to such a question. The famous words of Rabbi Berkowitz declaring that, and I quote, as far as Jews are concerned, Judaism is fully sufficient. There is nothing in Christianity for them those words still powerfully echo in the minds and hearts of many. And yet, reading and listening to Father Vetus' presentation today, working with him and the Gregorian, having developed an enduring and honest, personal and deep relationship 
with members of the church really at all level, I believe that the sincerity of their emotional bond with Judaism calls not just for an intellectual reciprocal answer, but for an emotional engagement to dialogue on our part. Hence again, my question that I perceived as the real true challenge ahead. Do we Jews want to benefit from the theological heat and warmth that Christianity offers? My short response to the far-reaching perspective offered by Father Veteux is not the place to engage at length into the detailed reading of the Mishnaic texts that I've quoted. We would need much more time to do so, in particular if we were to try and understand through the technical difference between the miliarium and the antichi, the condition under which the sages of the Talmud perceive that one could be warmed by the knowledge of the other or not, benefiting from the other, but without running the risk of losing one's own identity. What such a distinction based on the Talmudic discussion recorded in the Gemara could mean for us today, in the way we as Jews could benefit from the theological heat of Christianity, would be a fascinating enterprise. And it is an hidden enterprise, as one would interpret a desire for theological warmth as a call to syncretism, or dilution of one's true identity. But of course, nothing is further away from my intention. Maybe suffice to ask as a conclusion, where would one need to look for a Christian theological heat that Judaism could be interested in receiving from its sister religion without transgressing Judaism's borders? I will answer at a personal level with personal experience that I will then recast in more theoretical terms. When faced with personal crisis, with grief, with anxieties, with loss, but also at times with joy, it is not only to rabbinic colleagues that I turn for guidance or for help. A few Catholic priests and theologians that I have known for years are also my personal port of call. And I have shared many burdens of life's journey with them. And I wonder, therefore, what do I look for? What do I hope for when, as a rabbi, I turn to them? And the answer is simple. It is not in the theological doctrine, and it is not in the official creed of their faith that I seek an answer. What I seek and what I get from them is the human knowledge and the deep human understanding that emerges from the experience and practice of their faith and tradition. That human knowledge is different from the one that emerges out of my own religious tradition. It enriches my own understanding of the human experiences without threatening the integrity of my religious faith and practice. This is where the theological heat of the other can safely be found, in what Heschel in his time called depth theology. And I quote Heschel, the primary issue of theology is pre-theological. It is the total situation of man and his attitude towards life and the world. Theology declares Depth theology evokes. Theology demands believing and obedience. Depth theology hopes for responding and appreciation. Theology is in the books. Depth theology is in the hearts. The former is doctrine, the latter an event. Theology divides. Depth theology unites. So after the breakthrough of true friendship, it is maybe the challenge of the desire to be exposed to the depth theology of the other that must be met, certainly on the Jewish side, if dialogue between our two traditions is to continue and move forward. And so I end by responding to Father Veto's question with another question which I address to him now. 
if we as Jews were capable of formulating a religious desire to be warmed by the depth theology of the church, would that not contribute even partially to demonstrate and activate our sense of responsibility towards the Gentile? So thank you again, Father Vito, for having presented us your perspective and enabled me to try and answer with my own rabbinic perspective. Thank you very much. So now I would like to produce the second part, uh, also without a response, unfortunately, because of the sickness of uh, Iman Khalid Benadou. But uh, for us, we'll be speaking now uh, Professor Felix Werner, he's a Jesuit. His uh, main association is at the Gregoriana in Rome uh, for Islam studies and dogmatic theology. But today he is in Berlin and will talk to us from Berlin. Well, welcome, uh, Professor Felix Kerner, and I like to give to you the floor. Um, but dear Emmanuel and dear listeners and watchers, can you all hear me? Ah, that's good. Um, thank you very much for joining and to you Emmanuel and your team also thank you very much for preparing so beautifully uh, this event uh, which makes it um, all the more worth to contribute uh, tonight Christian Muslim relations a Catholic theologian's perspective what I'm going to say is fairly conceptual so be warned and there will be many points so I recommend those of you who are easily bored or fall asleep easily, to just pick one idea of what I'm presenting and ponder on it. You need not be able to repeat all I'm saying by heart. After all, you also have the Dutch and the English version of my text. First, we will look at... Um, The past decades. From there, we will see which themes need to be developed now, and we will discuss them. I will conclude with some remarks on Islamophobia. Looking back, milestones. What are the milestones of the past half century in Christian teaching concerning Islam? I will focus on the Catholic Church's universal magisterium. In other words, what does the Vatican say about Islam? In fact, that question will often lead us not only to words, but also to actions. And of course, words are actions anyway. One final introductory remark is due. Can we have relations with Islam? Is it not always with Muslims? Well, no. Throughout the century, some Christians and Muslims were on good terms, in personal relations. We even know of lifelong friendships. But the Second Vatican Council moved things to an official level, from mere encounter to dialogue. That is to say, from the individual or occasional event to an institutional process among representatives of whole communities, patiently continued in spite of personal failures, in the hope of long-term mutual transformation and in view of the common good. Still, when we now review the last decades, we will be focusing on popes. That sounds like reducing dialogue to individuals again. Of course, a pope is meant to be the face of a whole community and can even become the face of an era. In that sense, let us dare to present a pontifical history of Catholic-Muslim relations. John the 23rd was the pontiff who launched the Second Vatican Council. We may call him the Pope of Respect. He was able to speak cum estimatione, 
with a sense of appreciation to all people of goodwill. It was with remarkable reverence that he mentioned the others, that is, unbelievers, believers of other religions and of other denominations. It is in this spirit that the relevant document of the Council spoke explicitly with respect about the adherence of Islam. It is well known, Nostra Etate will then speak of Muslims precisely cum estimazione, sense of appreciation. Paul VI became John's successor when the Council was in full activity. Would Vatican II prove successful with its huge reform agenda? We should call him the Pope of realization. Why? Because he understood that the Council was a groundbreaking challenge to be implemented in theology and ecclesial structure. Paul subsequently made key steps in this, for example, by founding the Secretariat for Non-Christians. John Paul II was elected Pope in 1978, the first ever Pope. He took the programmatic name of his predecessor, John Paul, who had been in office too short to live up to that name, combining the contemplative concern of St. John with the theological zeal of St. Paul, but also uniting the attitudes of his two great pre-predecessors, Pope John's respect and Pope Paul's realization. John Paul II turned out to be staunch in his stances, but mobile in his manners. And he was surprisingly open to other religions. Isn't that surprising? Well, no. If you consider two features of his life, for one, John Paul II was a philosopher, so a search for truth beyond the Bible was familiar to him by default. But even before that, he had strongly suffered under two practically atheist regimes, namely Nazism and Communism. So the importance of religion in general was obvious to him. Without faith, humanity cannot become humane. You might summarize the historic meaning of his many journeys, invitations, gestures, and messages under one tag again. John Paul II was the Pope of Relation. But speaking concretely, what happened in terms of interreligious progress during his papacy and probably because of him. He did, he, we need to see one structural step and three developments in terms of doctrine. Structurally, Pontifical Council of Interreligious Dialogue. John Paul II upgraded in 1988 the Vatican Secretariat for Non-Christians to the now famous Pontifical Council of inter for interreligious dialogue. The Polish Pope wanted to underline the importance of interreligious dialogue as concept and as activity. But what were the doctrinal developments? First two concern not only Muslims, but followers of all religions. The third, however, was specifically said in relation to Islam. First doctrinal development, purification and enrichment. Already in 1984, the not yet upgraded Secretariat issued an impressive document called Dialogue and Mission. It says that persons from different faith traditions receive, when honestly encountering each other, purification and enrichment. This is well said. Let us ponder on this formula for a moment. We are being purified because we get rid of much 
prejudice. Because we are humbled by the serious dedication of others. And we are also disillusioned when we see that many of our hopes are not coming true because God's plan can be different from ours. We are being enriched. Is that theologically conceivable? After all, we confess that our own religion is complete. So, speaking as Christians, we confess that Christ is fullness. We say that he contains all the treasures and of wisdom and knowledge, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And how can we be enriched by others? The letter of the Colossians offers a solution when it says that in Christ are others of wisdom and knowledge. So we need time and experience to discover uncover what is already present in Jesus Christ. Second point on doctrine, pneumatology. In 1990, John Paul II was able to teach in a prominent place, in an encyclical, that the religions are effects of God's spirit at work in human history. The last point I want to underline concerning doctrine is same God. One famous theological question is, do we have the same God, we Christians and Muslims? The Second Vatican Council had already made explicit in 1964 that Muslims along with us adore the one and merciful God. Now, John Paul called out in 1985 to the young Muslims in Casablanca that nous croyons au même Dieu, le Dieu unique, le Dieu vivant, le Dieu qui crée les mondes et porte ses créatures à leur perfection. So, we believe in the same God. We need to discuss this later. Before that, however, let us continue our pontifical history of dialogue. In 2005 came a new pope and it seemed a new phase in Catholic-Muslim relations. Benedict XVI first seemed to tear down the bridges that the popes of respect, realization and relationship had built. It all started in his home university in Regensburg. There, Benedict quoted the Eastern Roman Emperor Manuel II Palaiologos, the ruler provoked a Muslim interlocutor in 1391 by claiming that all the Prophet of Islam had brought about was violence. Benedict slightly toned down the quote by marking it out as surprisingly harsh. For the published version of his speech, the pontiff took the quote practically back by now qualifying it as expression of a startling brusqueness, a brusqueness that we find unacceptable. But what remained was Benedict's claim that Christianity is fundamentally more rational than Islam. That, however, cannot be upheld if one studies Christian and Islamic theologies. A correct presentation would have to say that the Islamic understanding of truth is more conceptual. It is closer to theoretical philosophy than the Christian understanding of truth. But Christian faith Rationality is historical. Truth is discovered in history. Christianity hinges on God's revealing himself in events, more specifically in the history which culminates in the Easter events. So the core claim of Regensburg is highly pro problematic. So never correcting this doctrinal weakness by 
mis-evaluating the role rationality has for Christianity. Benedict the 16th later gave signs of humility and willingness to work for reconciliation, signs which were well received by many Muslims. I'm especially thinking of three moves. Adoration. During his visit to Turkey in November 2006, Benedict gave what should be called his Ankara address. In the Turkish Presidency of Religious Affairs, the then Pope said, as an illustration of the fraternal respect with, with which Christians and Muslims can work together, I would like to quote some words addressed by Pope Gregory VII in 1076 to a Muslim prince in North Africa who had acted with great benevolence towards the Christians under his jurisdiction. Pope Gregory spoke of the particular charity that Christians and Muslims owe to one another because we believe in one God, albeit in a different manner, and because we praise him and worship him every day as the creator and ruler of the world. That quote is interesting. It was in the background of the Vatican II teaching on Islam. The conciliar texts, however, only alluded to Pope Gregory's expression. As already mentioned, we will have to return to the same God affirmation in the discussion section. Secondly, forum. Due to Muslim patience, the insulting formulation of Regensburg was transformed into a promising process of profound dialogues in the so called Catholic Muslim Forum. And thirdly, side by side. Benedict's visit to Great Britain was, it seems, a fruitful contribution the growth of the kingdom, also in terms of understanding among the religions in London, he used a beautiful formula to describe the dimensions of interreligious dialogue. He spoke of the face-to-face -face dynamics, that is mutual enrichment and purification, and of the side-by-side -side dynamics, witnessing together, working together. So Benedict should not be called an anti-dialogue pontiff. He is rather a theologian who wants to go beyond the superficial agreement into scholarly encounter. He was, I suggest, a pope of reflection. Pope Francis finds much credit among Muslims. They regularly see him not so much as the spokesperson of the church, only, but of all believers, indeed, of true humanity. So, in terms of interreligious development, he deserves to be called the Pope of Representation, a model for every person of goodwill, as a Muslim once told me. A model for every person, for every person of goodwill. Francis uses the aforementioned formula of dialogue as purification and enrichment, and he wisely quotes it in the way Benedict also used it. Francis's doctrinal contributions to the church's view of Islam can be summed up in five points. Each of them is more than mere conceptualization. Rather, each of them is a speech act. Fundamentalisms. It is easy to point out to point at your neighbor's problems. It is convenient to say that Muslim militancy endangers dialogue, indeed humanity. But militant aggression is not only to be found on the Islamic side. If one thinks of the US war crimes committed with the Bible in the leader's hands at the beginning of this millennium, one understands well the wisdom and justice of Pope Francis's words in his programmatic exhortation Evangelii Gaudium. I quote, an attitude of openness in truth and in love must characterize the dialogue 
with the followers of non-Christian religions, in spite of various obstacles and difficulties, especially forms of fundamentalism on both sides. Point the problem by simultaneously admitting that we share in the problem is a constructive path towards the solution. Secondly, appeal. In 2014, Pope Francis traveled to the Holy Land, to Jordan, Israel, and Palestine. He had visited two friends from Argentina to join in his pilgrimage, Abraham Skorka and Omar Aboud, a Jew and a Muslim. And in the Holy City of Jerusalem, he sounded four lines, an appeal to all Abrahamic believers, a call full of both intensity and empathy, may we respect and love one another as brothers and sisters. May we learn to understand the sufferings of the other. May we not abuse the name of God for violence. May we work together for justice and peace." End of quote. Another key to solving our impasses is expressed in this, namely, do not think that it is only our side who is suffering. Learn to understand the suffering. Thirdly, prayer. It was an almost prophetic act when Francis's three predecessor, John Paul II, invited representatives of all religions to Assisi in 1986. The formula then used to describe what they were about to do was that they had come together to pray, not that they had come to pray together. At the time, it was especially Cardinal Ratzinger who was worried about syncretism. So prayers should, according to official instructions, not be said along with members of other religions, but only in their presence. When in 2015, however, Pope Francis visited the Jerusalem of Europe, as he called it, that is Sarajevo, a city long suffering from religiously motivated conflict. He invited the Jews and Muslims present to pray along with him, the prayer he had written. Fourth, orientations. In Cairo, Francis articulated an intriguing triple list of orientations to reflect his own way of moving ahead in interreligious encounters. Fundamental are, according to the Pope, I quote, the duty of identity, the courage of otherness, the sincerity of intentions. So it is by no means required, indeed, it isn't helpful to hide your own faith, to witness to your belonging, to your grateful joy in your own religion, and to express also the difficult things, just like Francis does. He does mention, for example, the problems of Christians in majority Muslim countries. And fifth, fraternity. In his new encyclical, Francis points out that all human beings are brothers and sisters. Pope Francis first sounded this motif when he co-signed a document on universal brotherhood in Abu Dhabi last year. Because there's much to be disputed in all this theologically, so we should now turn to the discussion of the open questions in Christian Muslim dialogue. Looking ahead, touchstones. There are seven theological themes in Muslim Christian dialogue which need new attention and precision. The first four also apply to dialogue with other religions. Only the last three are specifically Islamic. First, why dialogue? The official church has been in dialogue with Islamic representatives for decades. But the question is still being asked why? 
dialogue in the first place? The classical answer says that dialogue is faithful to Christ. He was mild. But we might say more than that. First of all, by dialogue, the church is not abandoning its mission to proclaim the gospel. Dialogue is not the opposite of mission. As a Christian, you must not say that you can only either be missionary or dialogical. Rather, we should clarify that mission is the reason why we do what we do. We are missioned, sent by Christ to be his witnesses. Dialogue is the style of what we do. And the point of that is evangelization. Evangelization, in the Catholic understanding, however, does not mean making others Christians. Conversion is not up to us, but to the Holy Spirit. To evangelize means rather to shape this world in the spirit of the gospel. Secondly, interreligious dialogue is not another word for ecumenical dialogue. The hope of ecumenism is that the separated churches become one church again. That is, first of all, that they recognize each other as different forms of living the gospel faithfully. So, thirdly, if one wants to say at more detail why we engage in interreligious dialogue, the answer is we hope it serves understanding. Understanding that is five levels. Agreement in practical questions like how to handle the call to prayer in majority non-Muslim places. Insight into the vision, conviction, the traditions and traumas of the other. Discovery of our own faith in the light of the other's difference and similarity, misunderstandings and perplexities. Testimony to the risen Christ that may allow others to sense what Easter is about. Finally, collaboration according to the shared orientation of Catholic social teaching, that the world may become a more truly human place that is oriented towards solidarity, personal rights, participation and rule of law, freedom of faith and conscience, distinction, cum, collaboration of religion and state. Second field, levels of dialogue. The classical description of interreligious dialogue identifies four levels. Dialogue of life, carrying the same minibus, for example, every morning, is already a form of dialogue, the church stresses. Dialogue of action, secondly, working together for the common good, is dialogue too. Dialogue, thirdly, of religious experience, the sharing of spiritual and mystical movements is set for the fourth dialogue of theological experts. In this oft quoted list, a fifth very common level seems to be missing, which also needs attention, reflection, and formation. Dialogue of lay debate. Non experts are often disputing their faith in a way that sounds polemical, intrusive, monopolizing, but it can be the beginning of a deeper appreciation of others in their enriching difference. Dimensions of dialogue. We have heard that the then Pope Benedict distinguished the face-to-face -face dimension, sharing on questions of religious belief, from the side-by-side -side dimension, cooperation. But there is a third dimension to that. It becomes visible in European universities today. We have a growing number of institutes of, institutes of what is aptly called Islamic theology. Some of the professors and students there are doing impressive academic work. Typically, a lot of face-to-face -face and side-by-side -side is going on with theologians from other religions, especially with Christians, sometimes also with Jewish thinkers. That's good news. There is also a need of spaces for confessional 
theology. That is to say, future imams, future pastors, future rabbis need classes also among themselves. With all the questions and inspirations they get from interreligious encounters, they also need to dedicate time to their very own traditions, their classical methods, their specific internal problems. We are not on the verge of creating a unitarian religious thought, but we see the different faith traditions now entering theological interaction. In short, interreligious dialogue does not only have two dimensions, but three face to face, side by side, and back to back. Dear Father oh, Felix, yeah. may I ask to shorten up a bit? Yeah, yeah. very good. Yeah. Um, um, shall we um, do, let me see, how many minutes do you want to give me? Three or? Five minutes uh, to go, but. Um, so I discuss the same God question and then go on to Islamophobia. Two Muslims and Christians believe in the same God. The church has been affirmative on this. But the reasons that were given are rather unconvincing. Why is this an important question? Let us look at the proposition we believe in the same God. The proposition needs to be seen from two fundamental aspects. That is, who is the one we turn to and what are we doing when turning to him? More technically speaking, who is the referent, God, and the reference, leaving. The referent of both Muslim and Christian worship and trust is indeed the one and only God. If you compare a Christian believer with an adherent of a Roman God, that would be different. If someone is a worship of Mars, calls him God, there is an abyss of difference between us. We Muslims and Christians. Jews understand by God the creator, governor, and fulfiller of the universe. That is beyond discussion among all who refer to the God of Abraham. In that sense, Abrahamic monotheists agree on what it is to be divine. And more than that, many of the properties we ascribe to God are even literally equal. For example, we all confess that God is merciful. Contents we ascribe to God, even if often expressed by the same words, are not identical. Most Christians and Muslims hold that the fullness of God's revelation is to be found in different moments of history. In the Exodus, in the Easter event around Christ, or in the proclamation of the Quran. But this is not taking back the same God affirmation, as if the aforementioned identity were mere equivocation misunderstanding. Finally, on Islamophobia. I was asked to say something on the problem of Islamophobia. It is actually a double problem. Islamophobia can be an apologetic trick used by people like Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Every critical word from a European voice is then labeled as Islamophobic. You understand this defense strategy, you can say no. I criticize this or that point not because it is Islamic, but because it is against our agreement or against democracy or against humanity. But Islamophobia really exists. It's a type of xenophobia. Now, it's quite natural to have mixed feelings in front of people we do not know. Fear and curiosity often go together. We need to know that this is a natural reaction which requires our clarity of observation, reflection, and action. If we look at the European danger of Islamophobia, these four considerations might help. Your neighbor may be a Muslim, among many other things. She is a student, perhaps, and a basketball player, and a fan of the Netflix series Stark, and a reasonably good cook and a great person to jog with. Don't frame persons into one single belonging. Islam may or may not be an important factor in the people we tend to see as Muslims. 
Secondly, just like many other traditions of belonging, Islam can be abused to justify segregation and violence. What helps is to have spaces where both Muslims and non-Muslims can learn about Islam. Muslims should have face-to-face, side-by-side, and also back-to-back. Places like classes of religious education, where they can learn about the great traditions of Islam, and their ambiguity, morality, rationality, and beauty. For that, also academic theology is helpful. But no, but non-Muslims should also learn more about Islam. Third, the best remedy against Islamophobia, together with historical knowledge, is friendship. Finally, I once had an interesting conversation with a Turkish friend in Jerusalem. Another group of people turned to us and said, oh, you are Turks too? Let us talk. We are journalists. They soon said, ah, Europe is difficult, a difficult place for us to live in because there is so much Islamophobia. My Turkish Muslim theological friend had a wonderful response. Muslims, too, can be Islamophobic, he said. I think that was more than a fascinating paradox or a joke. It means some Muslims, for lack of knowledge, turn away from their religion, and even most Muslims are afraid of the pathologic abuse of Islam in radical minds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Felix, for your lecture also. Uh, we are also glad to see new questions in the chat box, which we will answer during the Q&A, of course. Uh, I want to say for the text of the lectures you find on the Tertio website. Tomorrow, the video of, of unfortunately, not a response of uh, Im Benhadou, who is Ook even in het Nederlands, uh, voor toch nog wat meer wil lezen, uh, interviews met uh, Felix Keurner en V2 zijn ook verschenen in uh, Welkom in Rome, kruispunt van de wereld, een uh, boek dat genomineerd is voor de prijs van Christelijk Boek en waarop we ons bij november stemmen via www.prijsreligieuze.nl Dan komen we nu tot een heel ander verhaal, niet theorie van documenten, maar levensechte ervaring in Antwerpen. En daarvoor zijn we heel blij dat we dit zelf aan het woord kunnen laten, Monsignor van Bonny, over zijn ervaring met de dialoog hier in de stad Antwerpen. Deze lezing is in het Nederlands. For those who want to follow in English, there's also a translation of what the bishop is going to say. Dank u, Monsignor, om ook bij ons te zijn en graag aan u het woord. Goedemiddag, Emmanuel. Ik hoop dat u mij verstaat. Uh, ja. Proficiat met het initiatief van Tertio. Ik hoop dat alle, al degenen die verbonden zijn ondertussen een koffie hebben kunnen drinken. Zo niet mogen zij dat van mij nu onmiddellijk doen. En ik zal in het Nederlands spreken en excuseer me bij de Engelstaligen die verbonden zijn. Uh, voor hen heb ik enkele, een beetje de hoofdgedachten op papier gezet. Mijn verhaal is, zoals u zegt, niet theoretisch bedoeld, maar eerder praktisch vanuit mijn ervaring hier in Antwerpen. Ik heb uh, onder een, een vijftal uh, titels mijn gedachten wat samengebracht. Eerste luik, ik spreek vanuit Antwerpen en ik heb het over de kinderen van Abraham hier in Antwerpen. Uh, een paar woorden daarover, de Joden, de moslims, de christenen. In Antwerpen leven er een ruim 20.000 Joden. Voornamelijk uh, Hasidische Joden. Na New York, Londen en Jeruzalem is dit hier een van de grootste wereldwijde gemeenschappen van orthodoxe Joden. En ze leven geconcentreerd in enkele wijken, naast de Diamantwijk en in de buurt van de Lange Leemstraat. 
dat voor de Joodse gemeenschap. Dan is er een heel groot aantal moslims in deze stadsregio, geschat op ruim 120.000, op een bevolking voor de stad van ongeveer een kleine 600.000 inwoners. Dat wil zeggen dat zij nu ongeveer 20% van de totale bevolking uitmaken. Meer dan de helft van de kinderen die vandaag in Antwerpen geboren worden, komen uit een islamitisch gezin. Die uh, moslimgemeenschappen komen bovendien uit zeer verschillende culturele achtergronden. De meesten uit Marokko of Turkije, maar ook uit Pakistan, ook uit Azië, ook uit Afrikaanse landen. Anders dan de Joden leven de moslims verspreid over heel de stadsregio. En heel duidelijk is ook, zij worden de sterkste religieuze stroming in de stad, zeker onder de jongere bevolking. En dan zijn er de christenen, de christenen die wij vandaag hier noemen majority of minorities. In plaats van die ene Vlaamse kerk van vroeger, bestaat de christelijke gemeenschap nu uit een verzameling van allerlei uh, katholieke kerken en gemeenschappen. Uh, katholieke gemeenschappen uh, van uit alle continenten, ook uh, Latijnse en Oosters katholieke gemeenschappen. Er zijn protestantse kerken van diverse uh, stromingen en orthodoxe gemeenschappen. De katholieke kerk in zichzelf hier is al een verzameling van katholieke gemeenschappen van zeer verschillende herkomst. Dit heel kort om maar te zeggen, Antwerpen is een beetje het, zou je kunnen zeggen, Antiochië aan de Schelde. Hier zijn christenen van allerlei herkomst aanwezig. En dat alles in een grote zee, zou ik zeggen, van geseculariseerde medeburgers die niet tot deze of een andere religieuze stroming behoren. Dat was mijn eerste punt, een kort overzicht van wie hier zijn. Dan belangrijk, wat betekent het voor mij als bischop om in zulke religieuze omgeving te mogen wonen en werken? Ik heb hier een vijftal gedachten bij elkaar gezet. Eén, zelf heb ik het gevoel als bischop dat ik me beweeg in wat je in het Engels zou noemen een extended family, in een grote religieuze familie. Ik heb namelijk religieuze broers en zussen, dat zijn de andere katholieken. Ik heb als katholiek ook halfbroers en halfzussen. Dan denk ik aan christenen uit andere christelijke kerken. Protestanten, orthodoxen, die zijn wel heel nauwe familie van mij, wat ik noemde halfbroers, halfzussen. En dan heb ik in diezelfde familie ook neven en nichten, wat je zou kunnen noemen de Joodse en de moslimgelovigen. Al die gelovigen zijn voor mij geen vreemden. Zij staan niet buiten mijn religieuze context, Nee, ik voel dat aan als verwantschap en je zou zelfs kunnen zeggen als bloedverwantschap. En als ik over hen spreek, dan spreek ik over hen als over ja, mijn familie en de brede betekenis van het woord. Extended family. Een uh, tweede vaststelling. Ik heb veel gesprekken met Joden en moslims uh, in uit de stad. Wat valt daarbij op? Zoals het nu is, zijn dat meestal gesprekken met mensen die een verantwoordelijkheid dragen in hun respectieve gemeenschap. Daar zit dan toch een verschil op. Als ik spreek met leidende Joodse personen, dan is het meestal niet met rabbijnen, maar meestal met vooraanstaande, wat wij christenen noemen, leken uit deze gemeenschappen. Vooraanstaande Antwerpse Joodse figuren maar zelden rabbijnen. Anders is het bij de islam. Als ik daar een gesprek is, dan is het meestal wel met imams die hun gemeenschap leiden. Wat zit er bijna of niet in mijn interreligieuze contacten? Dat zijn contacten met 
Joodse of moslimgezinnen of families. Als je vraagt, ben je ooit ten huize geweest van Joden of moslims, dan is het antwoord zo goed als nee. En ik denk dat dat voornamelijk komt door mezelf, dat ik dat echt gewild, of als ik dat nu zou willen, dan kan dat, denk ik, maar daar heb ik tot nu toe niet op ingezet. Voel ik dat aan als een tekort? Ja. Uh, ik zou daar wat dichter bij het concrete leven kunnen komen van Joodse gezinnen of islamitische gezinnen. Een derde vaststelling. Ik ben met velen in gesprek, Joden en moslims, maar meestal niet op hetzelfde moment. Het is nu eens met de ene en dan met de andere. Het is een soort brugfunctie. Een brug staat ook met, verankerd op de twee oevers en juist daardoor kan ze een brugfunctie vervullen. Ik denk dat dat een niet onbelangrijke rol is om met de ene en de andere in contact te blijven en een brug tussen hen te vormen. Een vierde vaststelling. Als de andere gemeenschappen, Joden of moslims, een uh, zaak hebben waarin wij zouden kunnen meewerken voor de goede zaak, dan contacteren zij ons. En dat is niet moeilijk. Ik denk bijvoorbeeld aan de coronaproblematiek van uh, de laatste maanden. Heel vaak zijn wij met Joden en moslims samen naar de minister gestapt en hebben wij samen onderhandeld over een gemeenschappelijk protocol. Dus er zijn vlotte contacten over maatschappelijke toestanden of gemeenschappelijke belangen, wanneer dat nodig is. En een vijfde vaststelling, dat is dan een beetje een uitnodiging tot bescheidenheid ook voor de christenen. Ik stel vast dat joden en moslims, dat ook zij, beschikken over heel efficiënte kanalen van communicatie. Zij zijn aanwezig in de media, in alle mogelijke sectoren van de communicatie, zij zijn aanwezig in de politiek, zij hebben eigen politieke netwerken en zij hebben ook hun eigen diplomatieke verbindingen en kanalen, een ambassades bijvoorbeeld. En ik moet vaststellen dat hun netwerken vaak veel efficiënter zijn dan de mijne. En dat het soms gemakkelijker is voor hen om doelmatig te werken dan voor mij. Dat een paar uh, woorden rond uh, wat betekent het voor een bischop in zulke stad met Joden en moslims te wonen. Een derde kapiteltje. Als ik nu naar die drie gemeenschappen kijk, Joden, moslims en christenen, wat stel ik dan vast? Dat elk van die drie grote families interne vragen heeft, interne uitdagingen die heel parallel zijn. Dus de vraag is niet enkel... Welke, met welke vragen zitten zij onder elkaar, tussen elkaar, maar met welke vragen zitten zij ook ieder binnenin zijn eigen familie. En dat vraagt volgens mij ook de nodige aandacht. Ik zet hier vier vaststellingen op een rij. 1. Elk van die gemeenschappen, christen, jood, moslim, heeft te maken met heel grote interne verschillen, om niet te zeggen interne spanningen. In elk van die drie religieuze groepen bestaan grote verschillen van historische en culturele achtergrond. Verschillen ook van taal en van waardenpatroon, van geloofsinterpretatie en ook van observantie. Verschillen onder de Joodse strekkingen, onder de islamitische onder de christelijke. De gemeenschap, de eerste uitdaging voor elk van de drie is om gemeenschap te vormen binnenin zichzelf. Een tweede vaststelling die ik heb is dat als je de vraag stelt met wie hebben al die gelovigen nu echt contact? Hebben zij contact met vertegenwoordigers of buren? Of vrienden uit andere godsdiensten hier? Of hebben zij veel meer contact via telefoon of internet met geloofsgenoten, ook al wonen die in andere landen? Dan is het antwoord 
Het tweede. De moderne communicatiemedia laten het toe dat wie van elders komt en hier woont en soms al heel lang woont, nog altijd meer contacten onderhoudt met geloofsgenoten in andere landen en andere continenten dan met buren of vrienden hier. Bijvoorbeeld een Joodse gelovige zal via tv, via internet, whatsapp uh, en zo verder nog altijd meer contacten onderhouden met Joodse verwanten in New York dan met andere Joden in Antwerpen. Een moslimgelovige staat dag aan dag in contact met zijn verwanten en familieleden in Marrakesh meer dan dat hij hier contact zou zoeken met, met andere moslims, bijvoorbeeld uit Turkije. En Poolse katholieken hebben meer contact met hun Poolse familie in Polen dan met een andere katholiek hier in hun straat. Voilà, dus het digitale tijdperk werkt niet altijd. De uitwisseling hier in de concrete realiteit komt niet altijd die uitwisseling ten goede maar blijft vaak in een virtuele wereld hangen. Drie, wat stel ik ook vast als een handicap hier voor de uitwisseling, dat is de taal, de Nederlandse taal. De meeste hulpmiddelen die ontwikkeld zijn voor interreligieuze dialoog bestaan in het Engels, kijk naar ons colloquium nu, of in het Frans of in het Duits, maar bestaan niet in het Nederlands. Als ik spreek met Joodse of islamitische vertegenwoordigers of uh, religieuze figuren, dan is dat bijna altijd in het Engels of het Frans of met een talk, met een vertaler. Het interreligieuze gesprek, juist omdat het niet in het Nederlands of zo moeilijk in het Nederlands kan verlopen, komt hier nog altijd vreemd over, exotisch, als een importproduct. Wat eigenlijk jammer is. En het laatste wat ik vaststel als het gaat over ons gesprek. Wij zitten allemaal Joden, moslims en christenen in een context van zeer verlopende, verrijkende secularisatie. Dat is voor alle godsdiensten een nieuw bad. Voor christenen, voor Joden en voor moslims. En in elk van die drie families vind je alle mogelijke reacties of houdingen tegenover de secularisatie. Zo van een militante antithese, we laten ons niet doen, we zetten ons er tegen, ze moeten ons nemen zoals ze zijn, de ene kant, tot een heel rustige assimilatie. Waarom zouden we ons verzetten? Wij zijn burgers zoals de anderen en we moeten in deze samenleving onze weg vinden. En die breukeling tegenover de secularisatie, de breukeling tussen militante antithese en rustige assimilatie, die vind je in elk van die drie grote families terug. Dus je hebt een spanning tussen liberalisme en orthodoxie, als je wil, zowel onder de Joden, onder de moslims als onder de christenen. Goed. Dit zijn problematieken die wij gemeenschappelijk hebben binnenin elke traditie en die denk ik belangrijk zijn om er met elkaar verder over te spreken. Een vierde puntje, als ik dan kijk in de stad naar echte plekken waar men elkaar ontmoet, naar plekken die effectief verbondenheid scheppen, waar kom ik dan uit? Ik kom uit buiten de synagoge, buiten de moskee en buiten de kerk. Als ik het een beetje een theologische term zou mogen gebruiken, als je zoekt naar places of grace, genadeplekken waar Joden en dan vooral moslims en christenen elkaar vinden, dan kom ik uit in andere sectoren dan die van de godsdienstige gemeenschapsvorming. Ik geef een paar voorbeelden. De sport. Korte tijd geleden had opnieuw het wereldkampioenschap voetbal plaats. België zat bij de toppers. Uh, goed, wat merk je dan? Dat in een stad als Antwerpen helaas was het nu door het coronavirus niet mogelijk, maar de vorige keer was die rem er niet. 
dan vullen zich hier de straten en de pleinen van Antwerpen rond maxischermen. En daar staan dan een beetje Joden, maar vooral moslims en christenen en vrijzinnigen, broederlijk langs elkaar te dansen en te zingen en met drie kleuren te zwaaien en met shirts van de rode duivels. Dat schept effectief broederschap. In Antwerpen zijn er twee grote voetbalclubs. Ik zal er verder geen commentaar op geven, de Antwerp en de Beerschot. En nu, de tribunes van die twee voetbalploegen, dat zijn de, de, de plekken waar effectief een aantal Joden, maar dan vooral moslims en christenen, effectief bij elkaar zijn. Je kunt dat places of grace noemen, plekken van interreligieuze ontmoeting. Of in het sociaal leven. Op oudejaarsavond heeft in Antwerpen altijd een spetterend vuurwerk plaats bij de Scheldekaaien. Ik probeer daar ook naartoe te gaan. Daar komt, ik weet niet, 50.000, 100.000 mensen naartoe. Alles door elkaar. Joden, vooral moslims en christenen. Dat is een topmoment van gedeelde vreugde en hoop, heel dicht bij het concrete leven. Er is een restaurant in Antwerpen heel dicht bij het Mas. Ik mag wel geen reclame maken, maar ik doe het dan toch. Er is een nieuw restaurant, een initiatief van drie koks, alle drie afkomstig uit het Midden-Oosten. Een Jood, een moslim en een optische christen uit Egypte. Samen runnen zij daar een restaurant met uh, gerechten uit de, het gebied van de Middellandse Zee. En heel hun restaurant heeft zo een inter, ademt een interreligieuze sfeer uit. Dat is een plek waar godsdienst ter sprake komt en waar mensen uit de drie godsdiensten samen rond de tafel gaan zitten. Aanbevolen, u mag ze zeggen, dat ik u daarheen heb gestuurd. Napo. Goed, een andere plek in de stad, de school en de schoolpoorten. In Vlaanderen zijn er niet echt confessionele scholen, zoals in Engeland of Amerika. In principe kunnen alle kinderen hier naar alle scholen, met uitzondering van een aantal Joodse scholen. Maar daar staan moeders van kinderen bij elkaar. De lessen op school zijn voor alle kinderen gemeenschappelijk, ongeacht hun godsdienst. In alle katholieke scholen, waar toch ruim de helft van de kinderen hier bij ons naartoe gaan, zitten ze bovendien samen in dezelfde godsdienstles. Voor kinderen is het normaal dat ze opgroeien in een, uh, in een klas met kinderen van andere godsdiensten. Ik noem er nog twee, de werkvloer. Overal waar hier gewerkt wordt, in alle grote sectoren, staan vooral moslims, christenen en vrijzinnigen samen op de werkvloer. En daar spreken ze met elkaar over het echte leven, als je wil. Daar spreken ze over hun vrouw, hun kinderen, over hun man. Over zaken van gezondheid, over hun huis en hun buren, over hun geld, over hun familie, over de feesten van het jaar die ze meemaken. Als er uitgewisseld wordt, dan is het daar. En tenslotte ook in de politiek, alle grote partijen, misschien behalve één, proberen... Op hun lijst zowel uh, christenen, vrijzinnigen, jo joden en moslims te hebben. Je ziet het in het Schepencollege van Antwerpen, je ziet het ook in de nationale regering van België in Brussel. Goed, ik, belangrijk zijn nu voor mij enkele gevolgen die ik hiermee verbind. Eén, er hangt een premisse in de lucht en je kunt niet zeggen dat ze helemaal verkeerd is. Wat is die premisse? Godsdienst verdeelt, maar het leven verbindt. Of een andere premisse, wil je vrede, spreek dan niet over het geloof, hou je ver van de godsdienst. Goed, ik zal die premisse niet verdedigen, maar er is wel iets van aan dat het leven soms meer verbindt, het gewone leven dan de godsdienst. Uh, tweede conclusie, het moet ons religieuze leiders en theologen nederig stemmen. Namelijk dat de vaststelling dat de kinderen van Abraham soms beter met elkaar overweg kunnen wanneer hun religieuze of politieke leiders er niet bij zijn. 
Ik weet ook dat dat niet altijd het geval is, maar er is wel iets van aan. Een derde puntje, David Meijer heeft zijn tekst niet kunnen voorlezen, maar ergens in zijn hele mooie bijdrage gebruikt hij het, de term dieptetheologie. En hij schrijft onder andere, theologie staat in de boeken, dieptetheologie zit in de harten. Het eerste is leer, het tweede een gebeurtenis. Theologieën verdelen, dieptetheologie verenigt. En hij verwijst naar uh, Heschel. Het is een doordenkertje, er is wel iets van aan dat er een stuk in het leven zelf, een stuk diepte theologie zit, dieper dan wij met onze theologie kunnen vatten of naar boven halen. En een vierde gevolg, conclusie die ik ermee verbind, we moeten een beetje voorzichtig zijn als we zeggen dat Receptie van officiële documenten, een probleem is dat zich stelt van boven naar beneden. Etienne Véteux heeft erover gesproken en het was zo, hij heeft de term ook gebruikt in zijn bijdrage. Het probleem om officiële documenten die vooruit lopen op de realiteit, op wat ter plekke gebeurt, om die te laten zakken van boven naar beneden. Nu, volgens mij is er wat receptie betreft, is dat maar de helft van het probleem. Er is een even groot receptieprobleem, volgens mij, van beneden naar boven. Over andere onderwerpen misschien, of over andere gevoelens. Maar ook dat is een, een, een vorm van receptie, een die moet doorstoten van beneden naar boven. Het, het is, water komt niet altijd gemakkelijk van boven naar beneden, dat weet ik ook. Maar het is voor water nog moeilijker om van beneden naar boven te geraken. In de receptie. Voilà. Dan wil ik nog eindigen met uh, een aantal woorden over de gesprekken tussen kinder, de kinderen van Abraham. We hebben die ook. Er bestaat in Antwerpen zoiets als de dialoog. Van dialoog naar dialoog. Gesprekken waarin Joden, moslims en christenen betrokken zijn, die zijn er, alhoewel het kleinschalig, eh, klein, maar ze zijn er. Nu, bij die gesprekken tussen de kinderen van Abraham wil ik een, toch een paar bedenkingen maken. Eén, het is vandaag zo bon ton om te zeggen, we moeten vooral spreken en het liefst alleen over datgene wat ons verbindt. Want wat ons of van elkaar onderscheidt, ik zeg nog niet scheidt, maar onderscheidt, ach, dat is niet zo relevant. Bovendien, Datgene waarin we verschillen, dat weten we al lang. Maar we willen nu weten wat ons met elkaar verbindt en verenigt. Dit is noodzakelijk uiteraard. En vooral na jaren van vervreemding en ontkenning van elkaar, of elkaar voorstellen in verkeerde clichés, is het heel belangrijk aandacht te hebben voor wat ons met elkaar verbindt. Alleen... Ik vind het even belangrijk om het te hebben over datgene wat ons van elkaar onderscheidt. Het is niet zo dat wij, elkaar, dat wij onze verschillen goed kennen en dat het tijdverlies zou zijn om ons daarmee bezig te houden. Gelijkenis en verschil zijn volgens mij even relevant. Vriendschap of liefde, als je wil, heeft de twee nodig. Uiteraard moet hij zoeken naar wat verbindt, maar die probeert ook datgene in de ander te steunen wat de andere tot andere maakt. Als de andere van mij verschilt, dan, zijn, dan is er wel een optelling mogelijk, maar dan is er geen liefde of relatie mogelijk. Ik zeg dat ook in het ecumenische verband trouwens. De verschillen tussen de kerken die zijn relatief. Maar het gaat wel over betekenisvolle verschillen. Zeker als we de andere als andere willen respecteren. Dat is een eerste bedenking. Uh, het tweede, in de tekst van Felix Körner, vond ik een heel mooie uitdrukking. Ik had die nog niet gelezen, maar ik vind die heel bruikbaar en relevant. Hij zegt, er zijn dingen die we moeten bespreken face to face. Andere dingen die we moeten doen side by side. En er zijn onderwerpen waarover wij moeten spreken, back to back. Dat wil zeggen, met de rug naar elkaar, maar ieder 
over zijn eigen traditie, over zijn eigen familie. Er zijn inderdaad nog vele punten die christenen met elkaar moeten bespreken, onder christenen. Evenzeer als er onderwerpen zijn die moslims nog moeten bespreken onder elkaar, fundamentele kwesties, die zij onder elkaar verder uit moeten uiten. En er zijn ook onderwerpen die joden nog onder elkaar moeten uitklaren. Nu, we zitten dus, om het anders te zeggen, in elke familie nog met ons eigen huis. Nu, dat eigen huiswerk, dat zou mijn punt zijn hier, gaat niet zozeer over hoe we naar onszelf kijken of hoe we onze eigen traditie verstaan. Maar dat huiswerk gaat ook en vooral hoe we naar de anderen kijken. Hoe zien wij vanuit onze traditie de anderen? In die zin, Nostra Aetate, dat document van het Tweede Vaticaans Concilie voor de katholieke kerk, is al een paar keer vermeld. Dat was eigenlijk zulk een document uit 1965 voor de, de katholieken. Back to back. Wat zeggen wij vanuit onze traditie over de anderen? Een vierde puntje, en dan kom ik stil aan het einde van mijn bijdrage. Wat ik frustrerend vindt, zowel in de ecumene als in de interreligieuze dialoog, frustrerend maar misschien onomkoombaar, dat is de voortdurende doorkruising van wat men noemt de theologische en de niet-theologische factoren. Ik zit zowel in ecumenische gesprekken als in het overleg met uh, het jodendom op Belgisch niveau. De, voor het jodendom hebben we op Belgisch niveau een gespreksforum christenen en joden. Maar zowel in het gesprek met de moslims als in het gesprek met andere christelijke kerken als met de joden komen schieten die niet-theologische factoren onmiddellijk naar boven. En soms heb ik de indruk dat we zullen moeten wachten tot voorbij deze tijd, tot in het eschaton, vooraleer we zullen kunnen spreken met elkaar zonder fundamenteel geconditioneerd te zijn door die neologische factoren. Ik zet ze gewoon op een, een aantal op een rijtje, zonder er nu verder op in te gaan. Maar de Joods-Palestijnse kwestie schiet altijd naar omhoog in het gesprek met de Joden. Het islamitisch fundamentalisme komt altijd naar boven wanneer het gaat met of over de moslims. Het christelijk-westerse kapitalisme maakt het voor iedereen moeilijk om te spreken met christenen uit Europa of uit het Westen. Daar zijn die hegemonistische christenen weer. Dan de macro-politieke blokken. Je kunt niet spreken tussen Joden, Christen en moslims zonder dat heel de problematiek van het Midden-Oosten naar boven komt. De financieel-economische markten die maken dat ook binnen alle religieuze tradities de rijken de sterken zijn. Of het nu gaat over christenen, over moslims of de joden, maar de rijken zetten de toon. Er, zijn ook, er is de aanslibbing van oude vergaande culturen in onze hedendaagse godsdienstigheid. Die maakt dat zeker jonge generaties niet meer verstaan waarover wij spreken. Veel van onze beeldspraak, joods, christelijk en islamitisch, komt uit een godsdienst die in de woestijn is ontstaan die gekenmerkt is door tribale achtergronden. Bijvoorbeeld het gebruiken als het slachten van het lam of het niet eten van varkensvlees. Het is highly sensitive, maar wel verbonden met godsdiensten en godsdienstige culturen die uit woestijnachtergronden komen van meer dan 2000, 3000 jaar geleden. Voilà, uh, dus... Dat zijn allemaal niet-theologische factoren die jammer genoeg zo zwaar doorwegen in het gesprek vandaag en ons van elkaar verwijderd houden. En ten slotte een laatste bedenking als we het hebben over de gesprekken. Het is ook het opgemerkt door het INV2 in zijn bijdrage. Een hamvraag blijft voor elk van onze drie religies en voor ons drie samen. Wat is onze relatie tot de volkeren, tot de Gentiles in het Engels, of ta etne uit het Nieuwe Testament? Wat zijn de niet-Joden? Wie zijn de niet-Joden voor de Joden, de niet-Moslims voor de Moslims en de niet-Christenen voor de Christenen? 
Of om het een beetje anders te, te, te zeggen, stel dat bij ons interreligieus gesprek anderen aanwezig waren, wat zouden ze dan van het gesprek denken of wat zouden ze ervan begrijpen? Of als wij met z'n drie aan het spreken zijn, welke boodschap zouden zij, de buitenstaanders, aan ons gesprek hebben? Zouden zij, de niet-Joden, de niet-Moslims, de niet-Christenen, zouden zij door ons gesprek dichter komen bij God en dichter bij zijn liefde voor alle mensen? Of nog anders, als wij dan in gesprek zijn, voor wie heeft God ons gesprek bedoeld? Voilà. Weten dat de grote meerderheid, zeker hier bij ons, niet actief tot één van die drie families behoren. Er wel een, misschien een verband mee hebben, maar er geen actieve band mee hebben. Voor wie is ons gesprek bedoeld? Hoe verhouden wij ons tot samen tot de volkeren? Ook dat is denk ik een belangrijke vraag. Voilà, dat waren een paar uh, gedachten, suggesties, uh, die ik vanuit mijn complete ervaring hier wilde mededelen. Dank u wel, monsieur. Dat waren uh, zeer uh, terecht uh, mooie bedenkingen, mooie getuigenis, maar ook uh, direct ook goede vragen en tegelijk een synthese van vorige sprekers. We hebben nu nog wel wat tijd om uh, ook nog wat in discussie te gaan uh, met elkaar als ook de andere sprekers uh, terug opduiken. Uh, misschien waren het, uh, maybe it's good for the questions and answers. We have of course our three main speakers, but we will also have uh, Professor Vivian Liska, director of the Institute for Jewish Studies, who can answer a bit uh, the Jewish point of view, so that we are not alone Catholics uh, talking with each other. Uh, first of all, maybe Father Etienne, uh, if he is around. Uh, yes. uh, maybe it's good, Professor Vetter, if you uh, would have a reaction on uh, Robbie Meyer. We didn't hear his video. I tried to share some thoughts that he was sharing. Uh, maybe his answer was not a real answer to your question. Uh, what the Jews mean for the Gentiles? You returned the question in how can Jews be warmed up theologically by Christianity. Uh, would you like to react on what he said? Of course, yes. It, it would be a pleasure because he's also a colleague of mine. So we, it's nice to hear him in this other context. And um, he, it's true that he didn't exactly answer my question, but that is part of the dialogue. <laughs> it's to make the question shift. Um, and to hear how the other hears the question. What, what for me was striking in what he said, what you tried to synthesize, and, um, is that, uh, first of all, one thing is that he, he, he said, and this you did not say, uh, Emmanuel, uh, he said, that for him, it's not only a question of need, it, is there a need from the Jewish side of the nations, but do, do we wish to be together? Do we wish to do something together? And I found that a very interesting point is not to place ourselves only in the, on the level of do we need each other, but do we more freely, gratuitously, do we want to warm each other? Do we want to dialogue with, with each other? And of course, what you said also, Emmanuel, this was very clear, is the dimension of friendship. Um, and maybe the last thing which I, I picked up in, in what he said is the, uh, the and this uh, Bishop uh, Bonny also uh, underlined this, uh, uh, the expression Heschel has about um, the, the depth, depth theology, which goes through the heart and uh, uh, not only in theological conceptions. Can I say something a bit more on this point? But this will already be a bit of a discussion with Bishop Boney. Yes. Can I? <laughs> okay. Because um, I found very interesting in the way Bishop Boney also picked up this question, that the uh, um, question is, we've done a lot of theology, but in a certain way, it's also dividing us. 
while the, the life experience can bring us together. And uh, the, there was this expression, religion divides and life unites. The, um, and it's true that on the one hand, I think uh, that we may be passing to a new step in dialogue, which is more of the relational dimension, more of the life dimension and less of the theology. And for example, Pope Francis is very clear uh, on that point for ecumenism, saying we have to go towards a more relational ecumenism. On the same hand, at the, on the other hand, um, what I understand in Heschel and Rabbi Mayer's uh, qu question about depth theology, about depth theology, is not only daily life. What what Rabbi Mayer is saying, and what Heschel was saying at least, is we are struck by the fact that the other, even if he doesn't have the same theology, has a personal relation to God, has a strong experience of God. So it's also a religious question. It's not only a daily life question, it's also a religious question. Uh, so that, that I don't know if, you, if it, my, what I'm saying is clear, but I think Rabbi Mayer is insisting on another way of doing things, but on meeting the meeting the other religiously, uh, but not only conceptually, but really religiously, um, uh, which is more than only daily life. I don't know if uh, Monsignor Boni wants to react on that. Uh, I think you also uh, said it by saying that we are all on the same side. Uh, by also believing in the same God towards all the other Gentiles. Yeah, there may be something. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Of course, theology is important, and I would not be a bishop if I would think that religion and religious leadership is not important. But I feel my own weakness here in such a city to be myself with my co-workers an instrument of bringing religions together. Yeah. But in the meantime, I see what's going on. There is something like, as I would say, a societal exercise, an exercise societal mm -hmm. that is going on. For example, politicians, they, they cannot but learn and speak a language that is respectful for each and for all. People running an ordinary business like a supermarket or, I mean, whatever business, they cannot but deal with their co-workers and their personnel in a way that is respectful, even when they discuss religious issues. Or in a school, teachers, they cannot but speak a language is acceptable for all the students or children and parents. So in theological terms, in Christian tradition we say that the spirit is working and the churches. But there is something like an inter religious spirit. Theologically you can even say I think it is the the Holy Spirit, the spirit of religions working broader than the religions and bringing their children together in a way that is more effective than we as churches or church leaders or, or, or faithful communities can do. So, uh, uh, sometimes in, the, in a Christian context, we, we say, where are places of grace? What, what is a place of grace? But the, I mean, these are places of, of grace. Something new is happening. Of course, there are problems and there is extremism and there are conflicts. But on a deeper level, I think something is growing. That that is the I mean, that for me is the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh... If I look to the questions in the chat box, uh, maybe first a practical question that could be for everyone. Uh, for a more and more 
better understanding and meeting what kind of initiatives uh, local churches, Muslim communities or synagogues could take, uh, how could steps be taken to promote some dialogue in the local places. I don't know who wants to answer that. Hmm. Maybe Felix or Vivian. There are, of course, uh, many projects that have this um, basis uh, of Bishop Bonny's uh, intuition, religion divides, life unites, um, where you can have practical help now in Corona times, uh, organizing the, uh, the shopping for um, the elderly and so on. Um, this is really very beautiful. But, um, the side-by-side -side dimension uh, should always uh, also be open to a face-to-face -face moment, not being afraid of difference. Because the trap of um, Bishop Bonny's motto, I mean, this is not your life motto, but you, uh, you are mentioning it, so I associate it with you now, um, uh, religions divide sounds as if People cannot come together particularly well because of their differences. Yeah? Uh, living in societies where difference, variety, plurality is accepted because the depth is not a depth psychology, uh, theology, but a depth anthropology saying we are not using any type of physical violence. We are helping the other to express his or her difference in faith or unbelief. Yeah? But we want to discuss this also in a, a high profile differentiation. Yeah? It's, it's not dividing if you are disputing. Yeah? So um, coming from side by side actions, Corona gives a lot of opportunity. Also, to maybe easier after the Corona hype for personal contact, to um, the face to face is okay and not insulting. In Ankara, where I lived for almost six years, the wife of the socks dealer who was at the corner would only be uh, at the, the socks shop um, uh, on Fridays when her husband was at prayer. And she would always call me when I passed by and say, how on earth can you not accept the Quran? It is a later revelation and it is correcting some of the things you misunderstood as Christian. Yeah. Now, I could be insulted and say, why is she speaking badly about my religion? No, she's not. She thinks she is explaining something to me which I haven't understood yet. So to find fair levels of face-to-face -face is not dividing. Okay. Professor Liska, you wanted to add something? Is this my computer that makes this noise? Try again. Your micro is out. No. 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 That seems not to work. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't work, I think. Uh, some questions were also raised, uh, maybe Professor uh, Vete, uh, how can we uh, act with uh, anti-Semitic uh, uh, phrases in the New Testament and the Gospel? And also, but, uh, Emmanuel, the... excuse me, but because Vivian changed her position and she's trying uh, to switch uh, on her microphone again, uh, maybe. Uh... Yes, I could try. No, there is okay. Uh, 
maybe it's because of the speakers that it uh, becomes too loud or you should use maybe a headphone but i don't know uh, i try again sorry uh, father etienne <laughs> Um, so the f first part was uh, the anti-Semitic uh, phrases in the Gospels, but also uh, did uh, Christians uh, already uh, gave apologies to the Jewish people because of the, some theologians like uh, also Martin Luther, uh, his anti-Semitism, not only apologies for the Shoah, but also apologies for other theologies. Uh, theologians. Yeah. Uh, for as far as the second question is concerned, it's a, I'm, I'm sorry that Vivian Niska cannot speak, but they, they, we see that communication is not always easy. <laughs> uh, the, um, the question I saw in the chat was very precisely about Martin Luther and yes. about the Lutheran churches. And uh, what I, I may not have all the information, but what I think, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that there are many local Lutheran churches, especially in the United States or in Canada or in different places that have expressed, um, uh, that have asked for forgiveness for Luther's writings. I don't know of a general statement from the World Lutheran Council, uh, but I, I, I may be wrong. Uh, and it's true that many Christian churches are, are trying to um, react uh, and ask for forgiveness because of many, many writings. Of, uh, so this is a general process which is going on right now. Um, but of course, asking for forgiveness is only one step. <laughs> it, it's, it's not enough to, to to, to um, heal his, heal the wounds of history. Uh, as far as the what was called the anti-Semitic uh, parts of the New Testament, um, may, without entering too much into debate about this, I would say anti-Judaic aspects possibly of the New Testament, because technically speaking, anti-Semitism comes later, but it's not without a relation, of course. So, um, but I would just say two things about this. Uh, the first thing is we have to remember that the writings of the New Testament were not written in a situation where Jews and Christians were two di very dis distinct communities. So most of the writings are actually uh, speaking, these are groups of Jews speaking between each other. And even in the Gospel of John, we, we have this. Um, uh, and it's true that many exegetes think that the word Judaios in John, Jews, actually means Judeans. And a, an author like Boyarin, of course, everything is controversial in this, in this question. We can always dispute, but uh, this is a Jewish scholar called uh, Daniel Boyarin. He says, probably uh, when John speaks about Jews, he really is speaking about one very precise group of people who are related to the Temple of Jerusalem and not the whole of the Jewish people. So it's important to set things back into the, the historical background. But I think that what's also important in... in so this means that, uh, honestly, as a Christian theologian, I would say uh, there are difficult passages in the New Testament, but I'm not sure I would say that there are uh, passages that are really 100% anti-Judaic in the strict sense of the word. But I do think that the question is very important because every one of us uh, uh, needs to confront the fact that in our sacred texts, there are passages that are really problematic. Uh, for uh, A Christian would also say there are contradictions in the New Testament. What do we do with this? And uh, this is also a text that is considered as a revelation for Christianity. Deuteronomy, for example, uh, Deuteronomy 7 says that uh, when the people of Israel enter the land of Ca uh, the Holy Land, they must destroy a certain number of tribes. So how do, what do we do with these texts? And I think that the answer is always put these texts in the context of the whole scriptures then they are balanced and they find their right perspective. If they're put in the, in the context of, the, if you don't pull out one chapter or one verse, but put it in the context of the whole scriptures. Thank you. Uh, we try again, Professor uh, Vivian Liska.
Now it doesn't seem to work at all. What about now? Okay. No. I will write my question. Okay. Sorry. Because uh, we had some uh, questions who were interesting for you also, I think. Uh, like, for example, is Jesus today a bridge or a barrier for the dialogue between Jews and Christians? Uh, how do Jews today look to Jesus? Uh, there was the question of Professor Vitu, can he be a rabbi for the Jews today? Uh, maybe then Professor Vitu has to answer a bit. <laughs> uh, on this question, if Jesus is difficult or not? Uh, uh, yes, Jesus is difficult. <laughs> yes, I, I think for most Jews, Jesus is either not a question or a big problem. Uh, the, fa the inspirator of a religion that has been uh, a source of persecution and conflict. Um, but on the other hand, uh, what's interesting is that a lot of progress in these past years, but this is on the scholarly level, of course, a lot of progress in these past years about knowledge of who Jesus was and how close Jesus was to uh, the Jewish people and to Jewish tradition and so on comes from Jewish scholars. There's what we call the Jewish Jesus research with people like Boyarin or others that is very, that is really helping people to understand who is Jesus. Uh, for example, David Flusser, one of the founders of this movement who lived in Israel, he used to say, I don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, of course, uh, but he is a religious genius and I'm hoping that in heaven I will be able to discuss with him. <laughs> but of course, this is honestly, I think, a minority. Um, similar question but not as similar because of the statue of Jesus for us but uh, can some philosophers like Emmanuel Levinas be a bridge in the dialogue I think it's also not only Levinas but maybe also other authors and writers uh, I think a lot of Christians today find inspiration in a figure like Levinas uh, does this help or um, definitely <laughs> Uh, it, it's true that Levinas uh, putting the, the, the other, or, uh, Bishop Boni spoke about this also quite a lot, and uh, Father Felix uh, uh, alluded to this question, uh, it, is, is a very helpful figure. Of, of course, once again, Levinas was also wanted us to be very clear about where the distinctions were. So I think we had to listen to both. I don't want to uh, uh, monopolize the... No, no, I know it, uh, because <laughs> it's your questions. Most questions yeah. were in your direction or uh, mm -hmm. uh, towards uh, ju Jewish questions. Uh, but I think also the Institute for Jewish Studies is doing a lot of work in this case on the dialogue and is also helping and reflecting on philosophers and authors mm -hmm. and literature yeah. that can help us, I think, uh, we worked and collaborated a lot together on that, and it's positive. There was also a question for Father Felix. You mentioned software uh, giving witness, sharing witness, but how can we do this, and what do you mean by witness, uh, and how to bear witness together? Could you uh, say some more about it? What was the question? The, the formula is actually from Benedict the Sixteenth. In London, he mentioned that believers together can be witnesses to societies in which the question of the ultimate call of humanity, the deep desire of to find more than the material is held alive. So it is quite interesting that at the moment with uh, the terrible murder of Samuel Paty, um, the polarization of what uh, Fran French calls laïcité and religious belonging seems um, to slap in the faces of people. 
I, I'm not sufficiently familiar with um, the Belgian uh, society, but um, I have observed in very secular contexts in my home country in Germany that people who do not come from any religious belonging still are quite open to receive some steps, something spiritual from just any believer. And um, what uh, I name this phenomenon is a new vocation that faiths have in secular societies as long as they don't become immune to any spiritual impulse by calling themselves la laicite, like, and uh, religion has no space in uh, the public sphere. The name I give to this is our vocation is as people of belief and of any religious beliefs is inspiration. Yeah? We can encourage the whole of society, the way we deal with fundamental questions, with fundamental challenges in a new way, creative, with energy, with courage, because we just intuitively live out our trust in God's plan, wisdom, power. Yeah? Ob obviously not in a superstitious way, uh, obviously uh, not in a way of also ready to listen uh, to the others and their questions, uh, but this vocation to inspire is our way of witnessing, and I would like to underline that witnessing is more convincing if it is not programmed, planned. I do this so that people understand how beautiful faith is. No, I do this because I'm convinced of it, because this fills my life, because this uh, gives me joy, gives meaning to my life. That's why I do it. And that gives authenticity without strategy to my way of living, acting and interacting. Thank you. Another question for uh, Monsignor Boni. Uh, it uh, relates to the coronavirus. If uh, the pandemic is uh, making uh, a crossover dialogue or is it improving and uh, giving impulse to dialogue? Uh, I think that it can be maybe for the side by side or face to face meetings or not. <laughs> The microphone is not on. <laughs> it's clear, I think, that the fact that all of us, our all families, our communities are going through the same, same crisis is bringing communities together. There is a kind of solidarity in dealing with the same, I mean, the same problems, be it in hospitals, be it in politics, be it in, in neighborhoods. So it brings communities closer to one another. Then in, the, the, in Belgium, speaking for Belgium now, we worked very much together, all religions, uh, with the government for establishing a protocol on how we would come together, how we would celebrate, what kind of liturgies we would do, the numbers of faithful we could bring together. So that whole protocol has been established to all religions together. So there was in April, May, I think that nearly every week, a delegation of all religious leaders went to the minister for to discussing together the protocol. It brought it together. Yesterday, a Muslim leader phoned me to know how we would deal now with the new uh, 
measures that were taken by the Belgian government. It brings us together, that's, that's clear. Um, will it continue? Uh, that's, I mean, the question for the whole of the corona crisis and the whole of society. What will be lasting effects and what will be temporary? It's hard to say it today, I, I think. But anyway, it, it brings us together, I think, and the whole of humanity, hopefully. Okay, I think we have to close our uh, webinar at this hour. Uh, it was foreseen to stop at this time. Uh, rests me to thank uh, all of you who participated, especially our uh, speakers, of course, Monsignor Johan Bonny, Professor Felix Kerner, Professor Etienne Vete, and Robbie David Meyer, although we didn't hear his video, but I want to repeat that uh, people can uh, see the texts of the lectures in English and Dutch on both websites of Uxia and Tertio, and that also our webinar will be available to this uh, video. So thank you very much to all speakers, and thank you also for both partners the event, uh, the Institute of Jewish Studies and Uxia, who made it possible to use this platform of the university also. So a great thanks to all of you. And I Emmanuel, we want to thank you. Does it work now, magically? Perfect. Perfect. So, Perfect. Yes. <laughs> then we we want to thank you all for organizing this and congratulate you again. And uh, in the chat, you will find some thoughts for the future. Thank you. Thank you. It's the best way to have the last word, Vivian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The last Thank word you to all. you, Monsignor. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So oh. all, the best, all the best for you. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. And the fathers. It was nice to be connected with Rome and Berlin at the same time and yeah. a little yeah. bit with New York. <laughs> yeah.